Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Listen to the teaching of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Genesis. Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you know any place like that? Is it just a place of a long time ago that has no relevance to us today? Are these places that were uh, so foreign and so far removed from us that they have no bearing today? Do you know any place like that? Have you been to Sodom lately? And then there's, you know, Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah. If we think about uh, Sodom, uh, what is, is basically a place where uh, perversion and a place where anything goes, a place where we can um, take advantage of other people forcibly or any way we want. Does that sound like any place that you know about today? A place where we're more, we're more concerned about getting what we want than what anybody else wants? where we are uh, willing to hurt others in order to get where we want to be. You know anybody like that, any place like that today? Have you been to Sodom lately? Is there a place that you know of where people are uh, really is about uh, violence and, and uh, where perversion is taken at an all-time high and it's running rampant? Or is that just a place a long time ago? place like Gomorrah, where violence is running rampant in the streets, and it's not only accepted, but it's embraced and it's celebrated? Do we know any place like that today? A place where violence is uh, becoming the norm, and it's not a third world country, but it's in front of us. So looking at some of the statistics from the National Human Trafficking 24.9 million people are victims of forced, forced labor. 24.9. 16 million people are trafficked for forced labor in the private economy. 4.8 million people are trafficked for forced sexual exploitation. Women and girls are disproportionately affected by human trafficking, accounting for 71% of the victims. Forced labor in the private economy generates an estimated $150 billion in illegal profits every year. 3.8 million adults are trafficked for forced sexual exploitation, and 1 million, 1.0 million children are trafficked for com commercial sexual exploitations. So as I look at this, and I look at these statistics, I have to, I have to realize today that these are relevant. And then I read in the scriptures, as Ron was reading, in verse 11 and 13, what to me, God said, is the multitude of your sacrifices. I've had enough of burnt offerings. I cannot endure solemn assemblies. Your appointed festivals my soul hates. They have become a burden to me, and I am weary of bearing them. And God is saying that your religion has become a sham. God is saying that the religion of those who, uh, uh, who honor me with their lips, but are their hearts are far from me, do not do anything for me. For people who say uh, they'll do one thing on Sunday and something else on Monday, that doesn't honor me and that doesn't glorify me. Your festivals and your celebrations and your singing and your raising of hands do not really move me when I see your hearts and I see your actions and I watch your lives. Do you know anybody whose religion is like that? People who speak all the right words but live all the wrong lives. They dress up, they show up, they sit there quietly as if that's all God wants 
from them. And they'll put their two cents in or, or do their, uh, their weekly duty. But their heart is far from God. I think about people in the restaurants who work and some of the waitress who tell me sometimes that the worst crowd, the worst people to deal with are the Sunday crowd of the church people coming in who treat them less than human and leave them almost no tip. Do you know anybody like that? Have you been to Sodom or have you been to Gomorrah or do you know any place like that? Do you know a religion like that? A religion that's only part religion? It's only the kind of religion that we use God as like our mascot that, you know, he makes us feel better. And maybe we carry a Bible in the car for uh, superstitious reasons as if it's going to bring us good luck. But it doesn't really change our lives. Do you know any religion like that? And then we come to verse 16 and 18. And God says about this, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. But it doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. He says, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. And if you're, and he says, though the, uh, though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be like snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as wool or snow. And if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good of the land. Do you know a God who would make such an outrageous offer? <laughs> do you know a God who would do such an extraordinary thing? A God who's unwilling to give up? A God who's unwilling to stop, to let loose? A God whose love will not let me go? Do you know a God like that? A God who says, even after I've spent all my money and all his money in a foreign country and ruined his reputation and gave him a black eye and did all the things that I shouldn't have done, and I dare come home and say, please take me in, and he does? Do you know a God like that? A God who hates sin but won't stop loving the sinner. Do you know a God like that? A God who's willing to go the extra mile, who will over and over and over again give you a second and third and fourth chance. Do you happen to know a God like that? A mysterious God. A God above our manipulations and outside our control. A God who can't be put in our image and molded in our image. A God that can't be confined to our politics of the day or our beliefs of the day. But a God who's above us, but yet within us. Not a narrow God. Not an exclusive God. Not a God of boundaries, just limitless boundaries or tight boundaries. Or silly rules. A God that's tolerant of doubts. Not afraid of questions. A God that's unstruggled, uh, unworried about our struggles and our search for him who is secure in his identity and waits for us to discover ours and is patient with us. A God of redemption, a God of forgiveness, a God of new life. Do you know a God like that? Maybe this passage is too old. Maybe it's not relevant to us today. If Sodom and Gomorrah are, are places that no longer exist and they don't have anything to do with us today, if the passage is so old and irrelevant that it was just about a people who did something bad, then it doesn't really mean anything to us today. But if Sodom and Gomorrah is a story about not just something that happened long ago and something that somebody did that was bad. But if it's a story about us, if it's a story about our nation, if it's a story about our world today, if it's a story about what we're going through, 
then maybe it has all the relevance in the world. We, we've made this story just about one people and one little thing and one little problem, but let me tell you something. When we see, uh, you know, when you look at the, the, the problems that God had with Sodom and Gomorrah, it was a whole list of things, including violence and mistreatment and neglecting the poor. It was about a place where people were more self-absorbed and we're worried about immediate gratifications and abuse of an exploitation of others. But if there really is a God willing and able to cleanse and forgive, if all this is true, and I believe it is, then it has relevance for us today. And that behooves the question is, what are we doing with our lives? You see, sometimes I think it makes us feel better when we can point to others and look at their sins and magnify them as if it makes ours a little smaller. And you know, we, we pride ourselves on hating the sin of others. But Jesus never really talked about hating the sins of others. He talked about hating our own sins. And that if we can look within us and see the evil within us and the sin within us and the wrong and the perversion within our own hearts. Then Jesus said, maybe when you get all that taken care of, then you might have time to do the others. Why are our values so warped and our priorities so wrong? Why is it that sometimes our worship is so half-hearted and our service so lackluster? Why is that? Why is it that we have to have entertainment in order to get people to church, that we got to offer them food or offer them uh, some kind of music or, or uh, people up on the stage dancing around? Why is that? Is it not enough for us to come and worship a God who loved us, who created us, who made this world? Is that not enough to make us excited about serving God? Do we really have to be entertained in order to come to church? Is it today that our world is becoming so, our priorities are so wrong that, that sports takes the place of God? Why is our worship so half-hearted sometimes? This, not long ago, I picked up a book. It's called uh, Then Sings My Soul. Anybody recognize that book? I don't even remember where I got it. Do you? Well, I, I'm not sure, but uh, I do know that I got a lot of Charlie Douglas's library. And uh, John was telling me that Charlie used to, uh, to do some sermons based on hymns. And I said, well, that's what I'm doing today. And so there's some stories in this book about uh, some of the hymns of the greatest hymns in the world. And it's called Then Sings My Soul. And so I thought I'd take this, this service and maybe spend some time on doing some stories of hymns. And it might be a couple weeks. It might be a couple months. I don't know. Well, we'll let the Lord lead on that. But it tells the stories of some of the best loved hymns. And so that kind of inspired me to do a sermon series based upon these hymns, but showing the biblical principle as well. As you know, most of our hymns have biblical scriptures as, that go along with them. They're based on scripture. In fact, Isaac Watts, uh, before, in England, before uh, hymns were even a thing, they sung the psalms. And that's, that's all they sung. And Isaac Watts decided to take that to the next level and, and begin to write hymns for the church. And it wasn't accepted at first, but then it caught on. And he was the father of hymnody. I would love to take a trip to London someday and visit the place where Wesley lived and preached 
And I'd like to visit the cemetery across from his house and his chapel, which is called Bunyan's Field. It's called Bunyan's Field because John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, is buried there, and other dissenters, known as dissenters, those who refused to follow the state church and decided to follow God. It's also the burial place for Daniel Defoe, author of Robinson Crusoe. You also find some of Britain's greatest hymn writers, Isaac Watts, as we mentioned, along with Susanna Wesley, John and Charles' mother. But here also lies a man by the name of Joseph Hart, who wrote the song, Come Ye Sinners, I Will Arise and Go to Jesus. He was born in London in 1712. And in his early life, he was brought up in church and had the best of education. But in his 20s, he fell away from God and became an enemy of the cross. One of his early publications was a tract denouncing Christianity called The Unreasonable, Unreasonableness of Religion. That was really a, a kind of a mock or a, a refutation on J uh, John Wesley's sermon in, that was written called The Reasonableness of Christianity. He would later, after his conversion, apologize to Wesley. And as I said, he became an enemy of the cross, and he described himself as a monstrous sinner. Finally, at the age of 45, after a bout of depression, he fell under deep spiritual conviction. And it says in his, uh, of him uh, that he wrote, hurrying home, he fell to his knees in broken repentance. Well, we could do some of that today. And it says, My horrors were immediately dispelled, and such light and comfort flowed into my heart as no words could paint. He went on to write poems and songs and acquired an old wooden meeting house that he would begin to pastor until his death. And at his death, over 20,000 people attended his funeral at Bunyan Fields. And you know, the text itself is really traces his, Joseph Hart's own spiritual journey. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love, and power. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of my dear Savior. Oh, there are 10,000 charms. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of God I want to serve. That's the kind of God I want to fall before on my face today and say, it's me, it's me, oh God. Standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. As the musicians come, let us pray. God, forgive us. Forgive us of our sins and our half-hearted worship sometimes. Our neglect of our brothers and sisters and the needs and the cry as we hear their cries. Forgive us for forgetting you. And lead us, Lord, and free us to joyful obedience, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Invitation is always open if you want to come.